number of people that watch television is slowly declining, events like the Olympics are still broadcasted all over the world. With co-captain of the women's national soccer team, Megan Rapino, claiming, you can't win a championship without gays on your team, according to them, a queer-specific news outlet. We started to wonder if this also applies to the T and the LGBT community. Turns out this is actually considerable controversy in the media right now, and it begs the question, is there a space for gender diverse people in competitive sports? The main points of contention for this are hormone levels and conservatism, with pushback coming mainly from those that see gender inclusive competitive sports as giving one side an unfair advantage in the game. Before we dive into the controversies surrounding inclusion, it's important to look back to the beginning. Where did the idea of trans inclusive competitive sports begin? Renee Richards is a former tennis player, transgender woman, and trans inclusion activist. In 1976, her reassignment surgery was disclosed, and multiple tennis associations immediately instituted a policy of requiring all female players to verify their sexes. Richards refused and was barred from playing. She sued, and then she won. In 1977, Richards became the first transgender athlete to compete in a competitive sport at a world-class level. With Richards' victory, the quarrel began. Out of the many reasons why trans athletes competing sparks controversy, testosterone levels is one of the more prominent cases. So, what are the standard levels of testosterone in people? According to an article published by the Harvard Medical School, the average level of testosterone in males ranges from 270 and 1,070 nanograms per deciliter. However, the female body only produces about one-tenth of that amount, according to Healthline Media. In 2013, the Boston University Medical School published an article titled Practical Guidelines for Transgender Hormone Treatment. In this article, they reported that the target range for transgender men is approximately 300 to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter, and the target range for transgender women is approximately 30 to 100 nanograms per deciliter. Regardless of the understood standards for testosterone in individuals, some professional sports agencies, as well as high school and collegiate athletic levels of administration, have issued concerns regarding trans athletes. Their concerns lie on the basis of creating a fair competition, and, for example, some committees believe that trans women have a higher advantage on the playing field because of their elevated levels of testosterone in their blood, according to Allison Chu in the Washington Post. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA, believes that all athletes, or those wanting to pursue athletics at the collegiate level, should be allowed the opportunity to do so, regardless of an individual's biological sex or assumed identity. Transgender student athletes are to be granted the opportunity to partake in collegiate athletics as their mission is to, quote, to assure safe and equitable opportunities for participation. Transgender Olympic cyclist Rachel McKinnon made headlines in October of 2019 when she set a world record for a qualifying round in her age group. Her historic win was not without its controversy, however. Other female cyclists denounced McKinnon's win as unfair, citing the fact that her body went through male puberty and as a result kept its male physical advantages. McKinnon's existence as a transgender woman has caused much dissent in the Olympic community and the wider media in recent months. Her potential advantage has led to criticism not only of trans transgender athletes, but of the entirety of the transgender community, only exacerbating the larger issue of trans acceptance in our modern society, as reported by the New York Post. A similar situation occurred when a transgender MMA fighter named Fallon Fox beat her cis opponent so badly that she broke her skull, as stated by the USA Today. It is very likely that her having gone through male puberty previously was a factor in her ability to overpower her opponent. This reveals the ineffectiveness of the current separation of divisions that we have. Basing sports on sex assigned at birth excludes transgender people, but basing sports on gender identity can put people at advantages and disadvantages. Regardless, this discourse does not excuse the invalidation of trans people's identities. While researching Fallon Fox, the first three articles, either in their titles or in quotes, called Fox a man. This shows that there is a complete lack of sensitivity surrounding trans people's identities. Trans women did not choose to have a physical advantage over their cis women competitors, and it's important to keep in mind that just because they have an advantage, that does not mean we should ignore the exclusion of them from competing in a gender-affirming athletic environment. Physical activity is extremely beneficial for physical and mental health, and because we have a system that is inherently non-inclusive, gender diverse people often avoid the gym like they would the bathroom. Transgender people are already more likely to experience eating disorder behavior, depression, and anxiety, so creating an unwelcoming environment for them in athletic spaces will in no way help to alleviate these harms. Unsurprisingly, dissent comes from all sides of the spectrum. Compare her to Chris Mosier, for instance, an FTM duathlon runner and trans activist. 
He has faced challenges regarding his role in national sports as a trans athlete, but simply for his identity. He's a world-class athlete competing on par with men, with physical advantages, yet still is discriminated against due to his identity. Fighting for trans inclusion in competitive sports is tough, and trans athletes have much to say on the subject. One side of this controversy is well explained by Skylar Baylor, a competitor on the men's swim team for Harvard, and the first ever Division I transgender athlete. If we see a six foot three cisgender, not trans woman, who's good at sports, let's say she's good at basketball, we say, wow, she's made for basketball, right? We see a six foot three tall transgender woman, we say that's unfair. So I think it's really important for us to investigate those sorts of biases that we have and sort of transphobia or trans biases uh, in those spaces because those are really important things. That it's just lots of biological diversity everywhere. And of course there's biological advantages to biological diversity within sport, but that's how sports work. Conservative backlash has also been a driving force in the battle for trans inclusion. States across America are fighting for sex-exclusive sports down to the high school level. In November of 2019, Kentucky came to the forefront of this fight. Kentucky has brought to its legislator a bill that would effectively prohibit transgender competing in the sport that corresponds with their identity. Rules like these are not completely stopping trans people from competing in the sports they love. Mac Beggs was a high school student in Texas competing in wrestling. He was barred from competing with other men, so he had to wrestle girls as a result. Unsurprisingly, he went undefeated, seeing that he was on testosterone, a steroid, for his transition. While this seems like a comical retort to the unfair school rules, Mac Beggs experienced a lot of harassment for competing, with his mother reporting that, quote, somebody posted they should put Mac in a men's prison and he should be raped. He has had lawsuits filed against him for competing in the state championship, and when he won, the crowd booed him, as said in the Denver Post. While schools like Beggs' continue to be bastions of conservative thought, conservative-controlled states are beginning to back down. Beggs' own state of Texas, along with South Dakota and North Carolina, have all stepped back from transgender exclusion, with proposed bathroom bills being either killed on the floor or shot down by veto. Transgender people are slowly being incorporated into the competitive sports community, as they are being given more visibility, and though the controversy surrounding them and their identities is seemingly at the forefront of the debate, another group silently faces its own challenges, intersex people. Intersex is a term used to define a wide category of people all with one overarching commonality. People that are considered intersex are those whose primary sex characteristics, secondary sex characteristics, or sex chromosome arrangements do not line up with the typical definition of male or female. Intersex women face their own breed of discrimination in sports due to the possibility of them having overly high testosterone levels. Many sport agencies require testosterone testing to measure if someone is in, is in the male or female range. This can cause trouble for intersex females especially. In May of 2019, the Court of Arbitration in Sports ruled that middle distance runner Caster Semenaya must either take hormone lowering agents or drop out of the competition in her choosing sport. The decision mixes sex and gender in ways that activists would decree as discriminatory, such as the magazine the, the Conversation. Advocates on both sides of the issue debate over the place of intersex people in sports and it's difficult to solve independently. Intersex people and transgender people in sports alike are revealing the ineffectiveness of gendered categories. It is sparking a lot of needed discourse, but also revealing a lot of prejudice and hatred against gender diverse people. Both sides definitely have points to make, but the only solution we can foresee to this future is a complete restructuring of how we create sports divisions, perhaps instead basing them off hormone levels so that trans people and intersex people can compete without getting misgendered, ridiculed, or accused of cheating.